Welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm P. Renata, and today we have with us Mr. Najib Sinarimbo, the Minister of the Interior and Local Government of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Thank you, Mr. Najib, for joining us today. Pleasure to join the UP and Rappler. Mm -hmm. So, um, you've also been delegated recently the spokesman for the BPA. So, um, today we want to know more updates from the Bangsamoro region since it's only been six months since the BPA members were named. Yeah. and a little over four months yeah. since uh, BARM was inaugurated. Yes. So, um, Sigur, the first question would be, what have those six months been like for, for the BP and for the cabinet? It's been uh, busy, extremely busy four months for us. Uh, so we are in the process of setting up institutions, uh, which, is, which is a difficult part. We are also in a transition. So from the former regional government of the ARMM, we are transitioning into a new uh, structure, uh, which would be the structure for the Bangsamoro government. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the transition um, is not easy. Uh, so you deal with r roughly around 30 to 40,000 employees of the regional government. You also deal at the other level, the transition of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front from a revolutionary organization uh, that pursued its uh, advocacy through an armed struggle and moving them towards a more democratic process for, uh, for governance. Mm -hmm. So um, going to the membership of the BPA, because uh, the BOL, the Bank Samar Organic Law, says that the BPA should have 80 members. Yes. But as you were telling me earlier, right now we only have 75. Yes, um, 75. Uh, three slots from the government have not been filled up. And then recently, a member of the BTA, who's from the MI left side, just died, and, mm -hmm. and we are yet to replace him. So, uh, is, are there efforts now to maybe follow up with the government kung sa name three appointees nila, and maybe nominations for the two missing, uh, the one missing post? Yeah, except for our slot, which is the the one who will replace the former member, Attorney Dataya, uh, we will we we will endorse our nominee to the president. As mm -hmm. far as the three nominees of government, we leave that to government. Mm -hmm. So uh, you already have a nominee for the last. Yes. Year. And you've submitted their name. To yeah, it will be submitted to the president within the week. All right. Okay. So uh, there were some. BPA members also who were uh, talking about funding concerns, like they were saying for four months their salaries were not given to them. May update na ba tayo on that? Has that been resolved? Uh, yung essentially, the salaries for the regular employees of the IRMM, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's been released on a more regular basis by the DMM. I think the challenge is with respect to the transition fund that includes the salaries for members of the BTA and their staff. Because that's a budget uh, which is not specified in the, in the GAA for 2019. Uh, and so the, the source for that fund really is from one savings from the DBM and the um, contingency fund from the Office of the President. The other issue is that the the salary rate and the items for it uh, needs to be approved by the DBM. So, and, and there is a dispute between the BTA and the DBM as to how much uh, salary should should be given to the staff of the members of the BTA. Mm -hmm. I understand that some BTA members wanted funding for five staff members. Yes. Whereas DBF had funding for only three. Only three. Yeah, so and the salary grade also, as proposed by BTA, is higher than what DBM wants to approve. Mm -hmm. So right now, is there a deadlock or are we closer to resolving the problem? I think we're closer to resolving it. Uh, there is also a scheduled meeting with the new secretary of the DBM uh, tomorrow. So okay. I think we can resolve that quickly. But the four-month salary for the BTA members, has that been given to them? Yes. So. As far as the members of the BTA, they've received their salary. Uh, it's the staff who have not received their salary because of that uh, dispute. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So may deadline ba tayo or timeline for for the salaries of the staff? I we we wanted we wanted it quick, uh, but at the same time we want the amount to be reasonable corresponding to the work that they contribute in the in the BTA. Because mm, these are lawyers, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> mga experts in crafting yes. policies, yes. etc. Okay, so we're also coming into a critical period where the 2020 budget will be deliberated. Yes. So the president recently approved the budget proposal from the DPM and starting this month, we will be entering into budget hearings yes. in Congress. So um, BARM, do we know how much the BARM will be getting from the 2020 budget? For the 2020 budget, there are actually two components for the Bangsamoro government. One is the provision for a black grant. Uh, which is automatically appropriated. Mean so five percent of the five uh, percent of the net collection of the Bureau of Internal Revenue and the collection of the Bureau of Customs. From the data available, we it looks like we would receive sixty three to sixty five billion uh, as a black grant. Apart from that, uh, there's a provision in the organic law that national programs currently implemented in the region like for peace uh, health services will continue to be funded by national government we will need to propose a budget for that uh, and the other one is the provision on support to rural infrastructure which is really a catch-up plan uh, funding for the region so that we can improve the infrastructure in the region and be at par at least with the rest of uh, Mindanao. Mm-hmm. So it will fund municipal roads, barangay roads, bridges, and basic infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So in total, with the block grant in 2020, how much is the BARM getting if you include yung rural uh, infrastructure, infrastructure. funding? Infrastructure. We are looking at around uh, 70 to 85 billion mm-hmm. for, for, 2020. for 2020. And uh, does the BTA think this is enough? It's uh, and several considerations. There would not be enough, in, always uh, in government, uh, it's, it's not always enough. But I think we also have to consider, we need to consider also our capacity to, um, to deliver on the available money that's budgeted for us. Uh, it is a transition. While there is a huge need for delivering services and infrastructure projects, we're also gradually building up the bureaucracy. So we may not be able to respond quickly uh, to, to the amount of money that's coming into the region and, and at the same time deliver quality services. Mm-hmm. Will the BTA ask for a supplemental budget? For next year? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if, if we need to do that. But for this year, there is supposed to be a 30 billion uh, and program funds for implementing the basic law. Mm-hmm. We've not received a part of the 30 billion. So, oh. so last cabinet meeting, there's a decision to uh, program the funds and request the national government to actually give the fund funding for, for us. Mm-hmm. But the programming will happen on the BTA level, not on yes. the national government. Yes, so the directive from the chief minister is for the cabinet to to propose the programs and uh, the, the strategy for us is to get the bulk of that funding to support social service delivery and front load that to the barangay level because the current budget of ARMM, that's the 2019 bu- budget, is only up to the level of the municipalities. So we want to go down to, to the communities, really the people in the barangays. So the funding, that 30 billion should focus on delivering social services at the level of the barangays. Okay, so what's the cabinet's deadline for an actual programmatic uh, scheme for this 30 billion? It's next week. Next week <laughs> yes, okay. so the directive for members of the cabinet is to submit their uh, proposed projects for the 30 billion by next week. And you're targeting the, the downloading of the 30 billion by when? If you can submit next week? If, if DBM manages to to receive it, we are hoping we can have it within September. 
and then we still have September, October, November, December to deliver the programs. Mm, so by end of the year, you expect the budget to be felt by at least the barangays? Yes, that's the strategy. So, so we need, we understand the, the condition on the ground and people are expecting a lot from the BTA, from this government. We want to respond quickly to that by front-loading the programs at the level already of mm -hmm. the barangay. So when you say social services at the barangay level, what exactly are these? Health, education, um, social welfare. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the basic services that needs to be felt at the level of the community already. It's more concrete, but are you talking about scholarships? or? Uh, we'll, we are looking at improving uh, education outcome. Uh, so dropout rate is high, and we want to know exactly what's causing that. Part of a study that has been conducted is saying uh, parents are asking their kids, because they are poor, to, be, to, to do manual labor, so they earn uh, and, and contribute to the family's income. If we subsidize that, uh, so we expect kids to be attending school, uh, there are no health workers at the level of the barangay for now. It's at the level of the municipality. And the uh, health indicators in the region is among the worst in the country. We want to reverse that. And to do that, we need to put health workers at the level, really, of the barangay. Because that's where the poverty incidence, uh, mortality rate is not just numbers. This would now turn into specific names with faces. And that's what we want to we wanna do. Another deliverable of the BTA is the transition plan. Yes. So according to the BOL, it should have been submitted 60 days within the first few days of the creation of yes. the, the BTA. So what's the update on that? The BTA already approved the transition plan. Uh, it took time for the cabinet and the BTA to resolve the issue of what constitutes the transition plan. Because earlier, people were thinking that the transition plan would include a complex development plan, which we cannot deliver on a 60-day period. Uh, but but uh, the law actually provides that the transition plan should contain only two essential things. One is the structure for a new government. The other one is the phase-out schedule for employees of the former uh, ERMM. So those things uh, were completed and already approved by the BTA. Mm. When was the transition plan approved? I think a month ago. Uh, a month ago, yeah. Lang. Yes. So um, July. But parang from the reckoning of the March 29, it should yeah. have been submitted May 28. Earlier, yeah, yeah. Oh. So I think we were late by a week. Mm -hmm. But now, since 60 days na and the plan is there, uh, are you implementing it? What's the yeah. what's happening now? Yeah, it's now being implemented by the individual ministries. For instance, in my ministry, the Ministry of the Interior and Local Government, we've already scheduled the phasing out of the employees. The first set of employees will go in October. 30 of them will go. At the same time, we want to make sure. No, 30, 30 people. Oh. Uh, 30 people. Uh, at the same time, we are preparing for the recruitment process in January. So in my ministry, for example, we already conducted a psychometric examination for prospective applicants. So, so around 180 of them who've expressed interest to work in the ministry. So the first step is to hurdle the psychometric exam for technical positions. We want to do training beginning September up to December so that everyone who would enter the pool of applicants in January next year have already been trained. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we will end up with employees uh, who not have the experience nor the training uh, for doing the work. We don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So some of the ministries are already implementing their transition plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also read in a, a, a version of the transition plan that there would be a massive hiring. Yes. I think sometime December, um, January, is that right? January. January. Uh, so January, yeah, you January. will start making a call out for... Yes. And for how many employees are we talking about that you intend to hire within that period? It, it would not be... 
it's not far from what the ARMM, ARMM had, but there would at least be an increase because many of the ministries in the former ARMM departments were the skeletal. So for instance, in my ministry, um, what is required is that every municipality should at least have one local government operations officers assigned to them mm -hmm. uh, to supervise the work of the NGOs. But because we've increased the number of municipalities over the years, and we've not increased the number of items for local government operations officers, what's happening is that one local government operation officer handles two to three municipalities, which is not effective. So we want to do at least a one-on-one -on -one, uh, ratio. So one municipality at least with one local government operations officer. So there would be a substantive, uh, not very substantial, but there is an increase in the number of personnel that will be needed by the new government. Okay. Um, and then another thing is the the BOL also calls for the creation of an intergovernmental relations yes. body, which uh, the president and interim chief minister Murad already discussed in their meeting before. Um, yes. And I believe Chief Minister Murad has named seven for the BPA side. Yes. May we know who the, the seven are? The, the, so there are several intergovernmental relations bodies, the highest being the primary intergovernmental relations body mm -hmm. between the national government and the Bank Samoro. The, on the side of the Bank Samoro government, the, the co-chair is the Minister of Education. Ah, it's uh, Sir Iqbal. Uh, yes, so it's Sir Iqbal who's the head co-chair for us. And uh, there are several ministers that sits in the, in the IGR for us. So I also am included in the, in the IGR. Mm -hmm. And then has the president named his side? We are still waiting for the president to name his uh, people in the IGR. There are seven in Union, seven, seven. Yes, yeah, seven, okay. seven. And then there's a joint secretariat under the organic law. And you're aiming to meet um, when? The first meeting? Some of the IGRs, some of the department secretaries at the national level are actually keen also on activating their IGR. So for instance, for finance, the Intergovernmental Fiscal Policy Board, which is headed by the Secretary of Finance, for the national government and the minister of finance for the Bank Samoro, there is already a scheduled meeting today, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. this afternoon. So, so even if hindi pa nag meet yung main yes. IGR. Yes. Okay. Because I think uh, in the case of the IGFTB, there are really pressing issues. So like, there's a change in the sharing percentage for taxes between the Bank Samoro and the national government. So from the original 70-30 mm -hmm. in the ARMM, it's now 75-25. We need to make that adjustment already. Mm. So um, uh, how often will the, these bodies be? What, what is provided in the law is that only when there are unresolved issues uh, between the ministries. Uh, so, so for instance, now I, I think there has to be an organizational meeting immediately so that we can set the agenda and what are the issues that needs to be resolved immediately. Um, was there any basis for the concern that the IGR should have been convened earlier so that could have been avoided yung problems with the salary and the staffing? It, yeah, ideally, it should have been created earlier. But I think both the Bank Samoro government and the national government were busy with a lot of things. And, and um, if we we were quite late in in organizing the IGR. But you're making up for it with you know, going ahead with the other IGRs. IGRs. Yes, because there are urgent uh, issues to resolve. Uh, for instance, in the organic law, there's supposed to be an ad hoc joint body to determine exactly the meets and bounds of the banks of our waters, mm -hmm. as well as the zones of joint cooperation. The purpose for that is that the regulatory power for fishing inside the Bank Samoro waters is devolved to the Bank Samoro. So we want to know exactly up to what extent of the Moro Gulf and the Sulu Sea should we exercise our, our powers and what, uh, what is the sharing scheme uh, in the zones of joint cooperation because that is supposed to be determined by the ad hoc body. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Another deliverable of the BPA is to craft yung eight codes yes. or laws. Yes. Diba? So we have the Bangsamore Administrative Code, yes. Revenue Code, Electoral Code, Local Government Code, Education Code, Civil Service Code, and a law protecting IPs. Yes. And um, I think another measure that will organize the bureaucracy of the Bangsamore government. Yes. So um, what has happened here with the there, codes crafting? Many of the, of the mandatory codes are actually being drafted now. Um, in my ministry, for instance, we are given the task of drafting the local government code. Uh, we've done the policy studies. We we look at the provisions of the local government code of the national government, the local government code of the defunct ARMM. We are looking at areas for improvement, uh, like discipline authority over local government units uh, and how it works. Um, integration of the different plans from the lowest level of the LGU to the highest. How do we bring about a more substantive integration between the plans of the LGUs and the regional government? Because that has been a problem for a long time. Uh, we, are, we, we will make attempt to, to find appropriate provisions that will bring about this integration. Uh, we want to look at um, key functionaries in the LGUs and how do we make sure that this become uh, permanent civil servants, not at the mercy of the mayor or the governor. Uh, so what policy uh, directives can actually be integrated in the local government code so that we make sure that uh, when you train people uh, at the level of the LGU, you are sure that they will be there for a long time mm -hmm. and that they can render the necessary technical assistance for the LGU. So, uh, by the way you phrased it, it, it's the cabinet who will be, yes. as you mentioned before, drafting the codes. Yes. Um, and what is the reasoning behind this? Why assign just the cabinet and not involve the rest of parliament? So it, it will still involve the whole of the parliament. But the initiatory process of doing the public consultation, doing the policy studies, drafting it, will originate from the cabinet. And then from the cabinet, it will be tabled as a cabinet proposal mm -hmm. by the chief minister in the parliament. In which case, it will have certainty of being passed because it is backed by the majority of the members of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the cabinet is targeting when for the submission of their draft? The directive from the chief minister is to complete it uh, by end of September mm, yes. so that he can file it before the parliament in early October. Mm, and then um, how much time are you giving parliament to, to ratify? They the have until December of this year to deliberate and then approve. So you're targeting um, the enactment and implementation of the codes 2020? Yeah, the implementation should happen in 2020 uh, in time for the new budget, new structure uh, of the new government. Okay, uh, so right now, um, the cabinet, how does it function? We have 15 ministers and um, yeah. majority of them come from the MILF. Yes. Uh, how often do you meet and what are We what meet on a weekly basis. So cabinet wow. meeting happens every Monday uh, of the week. Uh, and issues are deliberated in the cabinet. Uh, when issues are resolved, it is either implemented by the ministries or it is tabled for approval by the, by the parliament. Mm -hmm. Since the MILF composes, many of the cabinet ministers are MILF also. Yes. Uh, how far does the MILF Central Committee influence the cabinet? Uh, there's no formal link between the MILF Central Committee and the cabinet in the, in the Bangsamoro government. But it is understandable that some of the members of the Central Committee, including the chairman, mm -hmm. who is now the chief minister, sits in the Bangsamoro government. So there's, a, there's no formal mechanism for influencing it, but I'm sure the advocacies of the MILF are being brought into the, into the cabinet. Is it true that um, before any cabinet meeting, there's a meeting by the MILF Central Committee where the same things are basically decided? It, it, 
it's it's not it's not true that mm -hmm. before a cabinet meeting happens there's a central committee meeting okay. there is definitely a central committee meeting that's happening in Darapanan uh, because the chair of the central committee still holds office in Darapanan every weekend so Saturday Sunday mm -hmm. he is in Darapanan to preside over the meetings of the central committee on weekdays uh, Monday to Friday, he is in the Bangsamoro mm -hmm. regional uh, government. Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, there's, I mean, di naman rin may help na, since it's also in the BUL that the BTA is supposed to be MI left led, led so yes. may influence naman na yes. Um How about the parliament? Um, they meet, I think right now, nag -iba from yes. three from three days a month, a month. nag six days a month. Yes. This was after the president made an issue about uh, hurry up, Bangsamoro. Is that, is that tr correct? Na they decided to expand. The to a certain extent, but but I think there is also a realization within the BTA that there needs to be more frequent meetings uh, and sessions for them. And the decision is to do it every third and fourth week of the month, every Wednesday to Friday. So three days a week, uh, two weeks a month. Every Wednesday, the chief minister will have what we call the chief minister's hour, where he will render a report and members of the parliament can actually ask questions or clarificatory questions from, from him. Mm -hmm. So this started last Wednesday lang yung yes. minister's hour? Yes, so okay. last Wednesday, the chief minister actually updated the parliament on what has happened from uh, the inauguration of the Bangsamoro government up until uh, that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to President Duterte, uh, you know, recently he's been saying that the BTA should hurry up and some took this as an expression of impatience and dissatisfaction with the BTA. How did the BTA take it? There's a variety of views also in the BTA, but, but I think the consensus is that it appears that uh, what, what was lacking then is a communication between the BTA and the president. And so we, f we felt then that there is a need to meet the president and update him. And then on a more regular basis, send report to the office of the president mm -hmm. so that he is updated on what is actually happening in the BTA. So now, how regular do you send reports it's, to the OP? It's, it's more regular. Uh, I think once a month. And if there are important issues that needs to be brought to the attention of the president, it is immediately sent to him. Mm -hmm. Is there a point person in the BTA who's dealing with Malacanang? It's still the chief minister's office. So it's, it's, it's a relationship between institutions, not, not individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and before, before the president um, made those remarks, how often was the BTA updating Malacanang? Malacanang, it's, it's also not very often. Uh, we were probably the BTA was also caught in the maze of the administrative works in the in the new government. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's been six months right, since the members were named, and yes. the BTA has a total of three years until 2022 yes. to deliver on the transition and um, set up the bureaucracy. So the pressure to deliver is great, of yes. course, given what's at stake. Um, and the long history of the peace process. So how does the BTA intend to make the people of the Bangsamoro feel a concrete change in their lives by the end of those three years? There are several programs being undertaken. I think the, the most important one is the effort to really restore the confidence of people in government. For a long time, people felt that this was never their government. This is an imposed government to them. We want to make them feel that this is their government. Part of the effort to, to build the confidence of people is that the ministers and the members of the BTA were made to pledge before God uh, in a form of oath that they will only do what is right. Uh, we've, we've done that also with the newly elected officials of the, of the local government units in the region. So in a orientation training for them, we've made them to swear the same oath that the members of the cabinet and the BTA took. And they've willingly uh, agreed to it also. Mm -hmm. So in, in our culture, uh, it is, 
it is very risky for anyone to take that oath uh, because if you don't uh, fulfill the oath, it will affect seven generations of your family. So it's not, it's not a simple oath. Uh, it is deeply rooted in our culture. Mm -hmm. So people now feel that the government officials are there to work for their interests. Uh, and then beyond that, we will do programs that directly addresses the concerns of, of our people. So just last week, the regional government decided to uh, place the emergency response uh, of the former ARMM named the uh, Armheart into my office. Mm -hmm. So we're also the one addressing the immediate concerns for disasters. Um, just this week, we've attended to over 1,500 displaced families in Maguindanao. Mm -hmm. uh, we've provided them uh, food assistance because they've been displaced by the fighting and the flooding in Maguindanao mm -hmm. in the last few weeks. Okay. Going to um, wrapping up on, on our interview, uh, I want to talk about an issue that would deal, that would involve your your ministry in particular. And um, it's something the president himself has brought up, yung, yung extremism, terrorism. Yes. He's been, the past few days, he's been saying ISIS is a um, uh, very deep problem that he is having a hard time addressing. Um, and it's something that involves deeply the Bangsamoro region. Yeah. So h how, as in your ministry, do you intend to to help quell the threat of terrorism and prevent violent extremism from spreading among in the region? In the region. We, I mean, we agree with the president that there is a problem emerging in the, in the region. I mean, it's not just in the region, it's in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in Syria, we've seen it in, in the U.S., we're seeing it in Burma. And, and therefore, the first thing to remember is that violent extremism is not exclusive to our religion or to the religion in the South, which is Islam. So you see extremism uh, also among Buddhists, among white supremacists. Uh, so it's not exclusive to a religion. Uh, second is that we should realize that the problem is already here uh, and that there are groups like the ones who laid siege to Marawi who are advocating this kind of an ideology. Um, the, our feeling and our, our assessment is that this ideology uh, is foreign to us. Uh, in, the, in the course of the liberation movement, we've never undertaken uh, this kind of a violence directed against innocent people. It has always been a fight for self-determination and for freedom. It's not for a particular belief which you want to force to some other individuals. Uh, so this is uh, ideology that is alien to us. And therefore, the effort is to ensure that our communities do not subscribe to this ideology and that the majority of our people still supports mainstream Islam. Uh, which shuns violence and, and extremism. But also, this kind of an ideology can only take root if it has uh, some issues that it can ride on. Uh, so, for instance, if you don't have a legitimate issue and you simply propagate uh, an ideology that advocates violence for no reason at all, it's not gonna be attractive to people and so mm -hmm. no one will subscribe to it. What, what, we, what we see happening is that these people are picking on some legitimate grievances of our people, uh, underdevelopment, lack of attention uh, from, from national government for a long time, uh, the, the quest for self-determination or genuine uh, self-governance. And they are using that to attract people and at the same time gradually propagate their, their ideology that there is no option except to fight. And so the, the effective measure against this one is really one to make this peace agreement work, to make this government deliver and, and to, to demonstrate that there is something concrete that is happening in the communities. Uh, if we manage to do that, 
uh, then we can confront the ideology, we can confront the spread of the, of the ISIS. Uh, I think the, and, and it's known to everyone, it, a, a military solution, uh, purely military solution, cannot resolve the issue. Mm -hmm. So you think that so far the BTA is on track to precisely um, address those grievances that have fueled violent extremism? Yeah, for now, for instance, in the case of the BIFF, uh, two of the factions are talking to us. And, and we've cleared it with the president, and the president is fine with the idea of some of these people going back to mainstream MIDF. Uh, we are explaining to them that they need to give chance to this government to prove that this one can work. Uh, and, and that if we manage to demonstrate that, then we can convince a lot of these people to go back to mainstream um, uh, advocacy for self-determination. How many BIFF members are we talking about? Who, who we have are talking to it? two factions. Only one faction actually has pledged loyalty ah, to two ISIS. Two entire factions. Yes. Which two are entire these? factions. Uh, uh, it, um, uh, part of that is Kari Alam's group uh, and Bungus group. The other one, which is uh, really the more extreme one, uh, we've not engaged with them. So, um, the president said, uh, anong exactly sinabi ni president? Kung pong makumbinsi na bumalik sila, pwede silang sumama dun sa normalization process of the MILF. So that means they will be treated as regular combatants of the MILF and they will undertake the process of decommissioning. Mm. How many combatants are we talking about? It's not substantive for the BIF. Hindi naman po marami yan. Uh, but, but because... It, it, it cannot be more than 200. Hindi naman madami yan. But, but the strategy they're adapting is such that they can create trouble in, in, in a bigger area mm -hmm. by simply moving from one place to the other. So you're thinking may impact naman. I mean, even if it is not the entire BIF, it's still, I mean, 200 combatants is still... Yeah, Something. that's substantive. I, I mean, if you can neutralize that and bring them into the fold of the MILF again, then, then that's, a, that's a substantive number. Right. So on that note, uh, we'll end our interview and keep praying and hoping for the success of the region. I think everyone is rooting for yeah. the region to succeed and have yeah. peace and development. Yes. So thank you so much, Minister Sinarimbo, for joining us today. Um, you've been watching Raptor Talk. Um, and uh, stay tuned for more updates on the Bansawara region and its government. Thank you.